All right. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our international ground rounds. It's uh, I'm very pleased right now to have um, the 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 probably I'm very proud to have him today because uh, he was the latest winner uh, for the research award that we provided last year in um, Thessaloniki. I'm very proud to introduce Professor Anastasios Maniakas from MD Anderson. Good morning, Anastasios. Morning. So um, Anastasios last year and his team uh, were um, addressed to, um, to get the sixth Nasosano grants in, in regards to their research in the in rhinology. However, today's talk is completely different. And, uh, and I'm very glad that he would like to share his experience and also some knowledge in regard to thyroid disease and head and neck, especially. For those who don't know, Anastasios Maniakas is an assistant professor in the Department of Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Texas, MD Anderson Cancer Center. So besides all the, uh, the, the doctor degrees uh, and, uh, and the, the residency and all the steps to become one of the of the assistant professor and the MD, MD Anderson, we, we are going to be focused today on uh, what, what is thyroid disease and how we can address some uh, um, surgical and non-surgical treatment for those uh, aggressive thyroid diseases. So please, Anastasia, if you would like, you would like to share your screen. I remind all the attendees if they will be um, aware of the fact that you can type your questions and we will reply and go ahead to reply all these questions at the end of his talk. Please, Anastasia, share your screen. I, all right, so let me go ahead and prepare this here. So just give me a second. Right, and perfect. All right, sorry, give me a second here. All right, you can see things well? Everything's great. Super, great, all right. Well, Puya, first of all, I'd like to thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Honestly, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really a great honor for me to be able to present here uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing here as a team uh, at MD Anderson. Um, but even more so, it's, uh, you know, there's that special connection with, with you and the, and the Nazusano uh, Association uh, with, the, with the prior award. And I'd like to, you know, first off, start by congratulating you on, you know, a wonderful association that you've actually created. I mean, this is wonderful things that you've done. And, and the growth of this over the last few years is truly amazing. So congratulations for that and the impact that you've had uh, both on the national and international uh, stage. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll um, give you my talk today. We'll be focusing on um, the advances and challenges in aggressive thyroid cancer. Um, I have nothing to disclose, and this is our team here at MD Anderson. And what I hope is that at the end of this presentation, uh, all viewers, participants will have learned the multifaceted practices that revolve around anaplastic thyroid cancer, one of the most aggressive types of thyroid cancers, whatever, you know, things that have to do with the evaluation of these patients, the care, and some of the latest research uh, in, the, in the current era. And we'll also show you some of the latest survival data on anaplastic thyroid cancer patients treated here at MD Anderson. So as a quick background, as you all know, thyroids can come in pretty much all shapes and sizes. So can thyroid cancers. And a large proportion of patients with thyroid cancer actually won't even know that they have it. The annual incidence of thyroid cancer has increased by 500% since 1973. And it's actually scheduled to be one of the uh, most common cancer in North America um, by 2030. And it is the most common cancer in young patients. Um, so how exactly uh, do we separate the different types of thyroid cancers? Thyroid cancers itself primarily develops from the follicular epithelial cells, while parafollicular C cells will give uh, MTCs, medullary thyroid cancers, which can also be associated with uh, multiple endocrine neoplasias. Now, anaplastic thyroid cancer only represents one to 2% of thyroid cancers. Uh, so the question is, why is so much work being done on such a rare tumor? Uh, and how do we actually get such a rare tumor funded for research? 
And the reason is because anaplastic thyroid cancer is actually the deadliest of all thyroid cancers, as most of you may know, with a historical 12-month overall survival of less than 30% for patients with stage 4B and 4C disease. And it actually represents more than 50% of thyroid cancer-associated deaths. So even though it is 1% to 2% of all thyroid cancers, it actually represents more than 50% of deaths associated with thyroid cancer. And in a recent SEER database analysis, they demonstrated that the median survival was four months and the six month survival rate was only at 35%, making it you know, probably one of the uh, most aggressive and deadliest uh, diseases in medicine. So how does someone with um, uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer usually present? Usually it will be patients around the age of 60 years old. They'll have this rapidly growing neck mass. They'll often present Symptoms with hoarseness, strider, dyspnea, dysphagia, a lot of pain sometimes, referred autologia, um, and it will probably be a combination of all of these. They'll almost always have regional lymph node involvement, and at least one in two patients will actually have distant disease when they actually come and see you with anaplastic thyroid cancer. So it is no surprise that the AJCC uh, has staged um, anaplastic thyroid cancer starting off automatically as stage four. It doesn't matter the size of the cancer, it automatically becomes a stage four. And it kind of gives you an understanding of the aggressiveness uh, of this disease. So what I'd like to do throughout the study is to kind of look at some clinical pearls uh, to keep in mind, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, retain and, and, and go, go, uh, go off with after this talk, um, things that really focus on the important uh, points to take out for ATC evaluation, management, uh, and care. So the most important thing, as I mentioned, these are patients presenting with rapidly growing masses. So you have to rapidly identify and have a good clinical intuition of the disease at hand. And then uh, once you've evaluated this patient, you need to have a way to have a quick and efficient referral to a specialized center, whether it's an, a tertiary academic center or a cancer center in your area. So to be able to achieve rapid intake and rapid evaluation of these patients, um, we had to create a, a program here at MD Anderson, which was started back in 2014, uh, primarily through the leadership of Dr. Cabanillas and Stephen Lai, um, where they developed the FAST program, the Facilitating Anaplastic Thyroid Cancer Specialized Treatment Team. Um, and the goal of this was to be able to bring in patients within one to two days of receiving a call or the consultation, being able to get rapid uh, workup in terms of labs, uh, circulating free DNA, staging scans, um, a quick BRAF IHC evaluation, molecular testing if needed, uh, almost always needed in these settings, and finally being able to see every single physician that's associated with the management of these patients. The goal was to be able to do this within one week and then to be able to place these patients either on standard of care or hopefully on a clinical trial. And the idea of doing this is to be able to decrease the amount of time that's wasted between seeing the patient, receiving the consultation and having them come in um, because time is always of the essence with anaplastic thyroid cancer. And what we saw rapidly is with the installation of this, uh, of, of this program, we went from seeing approximately 15 to 20 patients per year to uh, more than 60 patients or so by 2020, which is a more than 200% increase. And as you can see from the time the, uh, um, the uh, program was installed here in 2014, you've had this rapid increase. Um, and what, what this allowed is not only to increase the number of patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer being evaluated, but also increase the amount of patients being able to go on clinical trials, enrollment, and being able to actually complete clinical trials. Now, if you remember your residency, depending on what level of training you are right now or, or, or in what stage of your career you are, back in residency, at least in my setting, I had only seen maybe four or five anaplastic thyroid cancers in an entire uh, residency. And I think that's pretty much the norm uh, across the world. Um, and in this setting, with this kind of program that was established, um, more than 60 or so were being seen by the time we did this uh, initial evaluation of the FAST uh, program. And by, the, by now, we're actually close to 100 or so patients seen per year of anaplastic thyroid cancer. Uh, you know, so it, it gives a certain um, uh, specialization and it also gives a certain expertise to a center when you're able to offer uh, this high quality uh, setting. So um, as I mentioned, 
following the rapid evaluation and the rapid referral to a specialized center, whether it's your center or a center close to you. The next thing is to do a timely biopsy, uh, stage the patient and do a full genetic workup of the tumor. At least, at the very, very least, do a BRAF E600 D testing. Um, and the reason we do this is because it allows us to characterize the tumor and to then see how to treat this tumor depending on what the uh, molecular workup uh, is. So how is how does anaplastic thyroid cancer even develop, right? The main driver alterations for thyroid cancer development usually involve BRAF and or RAS. Now, these genetic alterations tend to follow thyroid cancer de-differentiation. So uh, they go from a very well-differentiated cancer like papillary thyroid cancer or follicular thyroid cancer, and then they kind of move into uh, a more poorly differentiated or even anaplastic thyroid cancer. And what really characterizes anaplastic thyroid cancer is this loss of PAX8, uh, TTF1, in the immunostaining uh, test. And then you also have these classic sarcomatoid sometimes uh, aspects to it, these more spindle-like cells um, that really lose the, the differentiated aspect of, of thyroid cancer. And you know, uh, uh, the idea here is to be able to uh, test these different mutations. So how does one actually test them? We can do it in different ways. The most precise and I guess the most expansive uh, way, exhaustive ways to do a next generation sequencing. Now, this kind of test is um, uh, very precise. It allows to test over 200 to 250, if not more, different types of mutations and fusions. The problem is the delay. Uh, these can take at least two to three weeks uh, to have a turnaround, sometimes even longer, uh, depending on the service that you're able to get. So we need to find something faster because two to three weeks in a patient who's already been sitting with their thyroid cancer growing over the last couple of weeks uh, or couple of months, potentially, is actually uh, sometimes even a question between uh, palliative care or, or, or not. So two faster tests that are actually the most important for anaplastic thyroid cancer uh, are the BRAF immunohistochemistry, which you can actually probably get within 24 to 48 hours, or even a liquid biopsy, which looks at circulating free DNA. Um, it looks at little small fragments of DNA that are found circulating in the plasma. The uh, turnaround for that usually within one to two weeks. Um, there have been lots of studies uh, that showed that this has been validated and can be a very uh, good way to evaluate um, genetic makeup of uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer, so much so that even in the uh, revised anaplastic thyroid cancer guidelines from the American Thyroid Association uh, mentioned that this was something uh, important to, uh, to look at. It's less reliable for less aggressive tumors. Um, as you would expect, a tumor that is extremely aggressive will be shedding DNA into the plasma. Uh, this is something that you wouldn't see in a less aggressive type of tumor. So let's look at immunohistochemistry quick, quick. Um, specifically looking for the uh, antibody that um, for the BRAF mutation uh, that if we're looking at valine substituted by glutamic acid. Um, when it's available, you actually should be able to get it within 24 to 48 hours. Um, uh, and then it, it, it has shown very good uh, correlation with what you have in the tissue in, than what you have on a simple uh, biopsy. Uh, so. This is a very strong recommendation to at least get a BRAF IHC. Um, and we'll talk more about why it's important to know the BRAF status of an anaplastic thyroid cancer. The next thing to do, if available or if possible, is to be able to look at circulating free DNA. Uh, sometimes patients will have very large tumors, um, but they'll be primarily necrotic. Uh, so it's very difficult to get a good um, a sampling. So at that point, you can actually uh, lean on the liquid biopsy uh, to see what kind of mutations you can have. Once again, this is a strong recommendation in terms of looking into this um, with, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the ATA guidelines. So once again, CFDNA, as I said, these are fragments of tumor that are being shed into the body. Um, usually turn around hopefully one to two weeks to be able to get the result. Once again, this has been added as an addendum into the ATA guidelines. So the liquid biopsy itself, we ran some studies ourselves here with our group. Uh, initially, we had shown an 100% concordance uh, between uh, the results from BRF E600D on the actual tumor and the liquid biopsy. This was expanded to a few more patients, and it still remained very high with a 93% um, concordance. What was even more interesting is to show that there was a 71% concordance with clinical response. So depending on how the patient was doing, if they had a very good response to treatment, um, usually the liquid biopsy 
uh, uh, yield would fall uh, as expected. You wouldn't have any more tumor being uh, shed into the body. Um, but same thing for the inverse. If you had progressive disease and was not having properly res proper response, you would still have very high amounts uh, of this still found in the, in the plasma. The barriers to being able to do a liquid biopsy reimbursement. Sometimes this can be difficult, especially in the setting of insurance companies. Um, and sometimes it could be uh, a bit slower depending on where you are. But these are things that are being actively worked on and then getting uh, more and more efficient. So why is it so important uh, to know about the genetic uh, testing? And, and we'll talk more about that now. Um, uh, this is a study that uh, Jen Wong here from MD Anderson uh, just recently published, um, where she demonstrated the importance of molecular testing, especially for BRAF. And you see that BRAF in itself is about 35 to 40%. In this study, we're up at about 42% of patients that will harbor the BRAF mutations. The rest will have RAS um, or some, some version of RAS. And then um, you can have various different other uh, mutations available, as you can see from here. But the importance of knowing the BRAF is uh, it's actually associated to a significantly better treatment outcome. Uh, these patients will have different responses depending on the type of mutation that they have. So uh, a BRAF um, mutated tumor will have a three-year survival of up to 45%, uh, whereas RAS only 11%, according to uh, the data that we're showing here. So why is it so important? Because uh, with the Dabrafenib and Chimedman breakthrough, and this was initially done through a basket trial uh, with Dr. Subaya here at MD Anderson, where they pretty much took patients with a, any sort of BRAF, any patient who had a BRAF mutation, depending, uh, that didn't really matter what kind of tumor they had, um, was placed on this treatment. And they saw remarkable responses, so much so that it rapidly led to the FDA approval of the BRAF and Eventumetinib for anaplastic thyroid cancer. And this was an initial study that came out in 2017. And then a, a more updated uh, study demonstrated a, a, a strong response rate up to 56% in patients that would, um, that would have a, a strong response and a overall survival rate at two years of 30%. Now, if you remember the SEER database, was talking about a survival of 35% at six months. Now here, with being a BRAF mutated ATC, according to this study, was already at 30% for two years. So it's a remarkable change um, in, 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 the, in the outcomes for these patients. So let's look at some examples of, of uh, responses to BRAF mutation. This is a 68-year-old patient who had shown here with a BRAF mutated ATC, and he was treated with the Brafinib and Tremetinib. And this is literally after five weeks, a remarkable response um, and that was seen here. Another patient here had shown up uh, already with a tracheostomy, um, and then four weeks following the Brafinib and Tremetinib for her BRAF mutated uh, the um, ATC had a remarkable response once again. And what becomes even more evident is that we can even start considering surgery, right? Because if you're able to shrink it so much, so um, you, it almost becomes something that is resectable. Um, so usually patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer will show up with disease that is deemed unresectable, right? There'll be encasement of the carotid, there'll be encasement, there'll be invasion into the larynx, um, there'll be significant extraterritorial extension into various different associated structures. So, but when you have this kind of response, like this patient did here, then you would tell yourself, maybe there's an option to go ahead and resect. Um, and, and, and this is a patient, for example, that had four months of a Dabrafin event um, In another uh, case here, we had a patient who, if it was initially going to be treated with surgery, they would likely need a full laryngotracheal resection, for example. Uh, after three months of a Dabrafin and Trimetinib, well, this patient would only need a total thyroidectomy, um, which again is something remarkable to think of in the setting of anaplastic thyroid cancer going back just as little as five to 10 years ago. So what happens to patients that can actually undergo um, surgery after having received uh, neoadjuvant uh, uh, targeted therapy? Um, and this is uh, some data from, from a study that we had published here where we demonstrated a significant uh, um, increase in the survival in patients that were BRAF mutated ATC, uh, those that had surgery versus those that did not have surgery. Um, and pretty much what we see is that there's an 83% uh, or so higher chance of being alive at any point in time 
and, and, and a median survival that at the time of the study had not even been reached. Um, so how exactly does one measure surgical uh, evaluation? Now, and, and I'll take two seconds to talk about this where I wanna demonstrate uh, resectability, right? So we usually talk about encasement of the parotid um, or significant invasion into adjacent uh, vital structures. Um, so what we've tried to develop here is a different way to evaluate surgical morbidity and to look at um, how this changes after treatment, right? Because we talk about complete response, we talk about partial response, uh, but this is more on the radiologic aspect. What about for the surgeon ourselves that we're trying to treat these patients? How does the surgery uh, change uh, following the treatment? So uh, we have this scoring system here where we look at going from zero, mild, all the way to four, which is unresectable, where we grade each patient in a different way um, and, and, and we see the severity uh, of the disease at head. Um, and depending on the type of uh, uh, invasion or extent of the disease, we give them a score going from mild to unresectable, moderate being minor extrathyroidal extension, uh, likely would involve too much morbidity uh, if we did a resection. Severe, usually you'll have at least uh, one cord that is out. You may have some tracheal involvement and may require a small tracheal resection. Um, of one or two rings uh, or three. Um, and then uh, se very severe or a, a score of three, you would have bilateral vocal cord paralysis. You would need an extensive tracheal resection. You would probably need a laryngopharyngeal or laryngectomy or esophageal resection. And finally, the unresectable one where you have you know, the classic 360 degree uh, carotid artery encasement. You have a nominant artery encasement uh, pre-vertebral fascia involvement, right? So these are, I mean, they, they, it sounds similar to, for example, in AJCC staging, but this is more uh, focused on the surgical um, uh, aspect of uh, the severity of the disease. So what we looked at, and this is a uh, 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 very interesting data that um, Xiao Zhao from, from here, from MD Anderson, from our group that uh, that is in, in the midst of, of publishing to demonstrate here that uh, how the uh, surgical morbidity score changes on treatment. And what we see here is that almost every single patient that had unresectable disease uh, moved to at least some form of resectability, but everyone dropped by a score or two on four, uh, which is quite significant, making uh, not only the morbidity much less for the patient, but also much more uh, feasible in terms of doing the resection for the surgeon themselves and giving a higher chance of uh, um, removing uh, tumor. Um, so here I'll give you an example of a patient who had um, uh, uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer. This is a uh, this was a 54 year old patient um, who had significant disease both local regionally and uh, a significant intrathoracic disease, as you can see here. And this patient um, had a BRF mutated disease and received dabrafen and bentrametinib, and uh, initially had a wonderful response. Um, had um, six months later uh, had this very uh, strong response, but still significant amount of disease. Um, so they came here uh, to see us and we recommended that we add on uh, pembrolizumab uh, because we thought that we could potentially get even more of a response uh, adding on patients uh, with um, uh, immunotherapy. And then the question is, okay, well, I mean, if you keep adding medication, what is there any end to it? And, and the reason here to add more is because we're, we, even though we have remarkable responses on, with patients on the and bentrametinib, there are still a subgroup of patients that don't necessarily have that strong of a response. And, and maybe there's a tumor reprogramming that is needed uh, that you can get potentially with uh, the, um, the addition of immunotherapy. So what we did here is we added immunotherapy to this patient uh, and we're hopefully going to be able to plan for surgery uh, this January when, when, I, when I restage him. And, and the reason is, I mean, I'm going back to, to this initial slide here, we have this wonderful response, but we still have a, a, you know, an important way to go to, to manage the remaining of the population. So how do we target this population? And we know that you know, ATC have different survival based on their driver mutations. Um, now, most patients will have actionable mutation uh, but a lot of them will have uh, at least 70% will have a PDL1 score of more than 5%. And what we've seen is that in patients, even with 1% or more, 
can potentially have a strong response uh, with uh, immunotherapy. And this is one way to be able to uh, uh, target patients that don't necessarily have a, a BRAF mutation. Um, now, uh, what I will show you is uh, some information on uh, some of the studies that we've been doing here, primarily led by Dr. Cabanillas, in terms of looking at the effect or the um, uh, the effect and, and what advantages can you get and what kind of uh, responses can you get with the addition of immunotherapy or what role can immunotherapy play in the anaplastic thyroid cancer population? And we looked at patients um, that uh, we separated the cohort in patients looking at the brafinib and chimetinib or an, a similar combination, bemirafinib and cobimetinib with an immunotherapy agent, such as atezolizumab, um, and then looking at patients that were BRAF negative, but had a RAS mutation and immunotherapy, um, and the uh, same as patients that had no RAS and no BRAF mutation, and finally, patients that also had just classic chemotherapy. And what I'll focus on uh, for now, just for time-wise, I'll focus on the patients that had the BRAF mutation and received immunotherapy. And I'll look at this subgroup analysis that was done and presented at the most recent uh, ATA meeting in Montreal. Um, so this is the group of patients here. We had 18 in total, all of them with the BRAF mutation. This is the oncoprint that shows this information. Most of them had um, a TP53 mutation as well. 56% uh, or so had a TERT mutation. Um, and what we see here in patients that received both the targeted therapy and the immunotherapy, we had an overall response rate of 72%, uh, which is quite important uh, and shows a, a significant difference here. Um, and if we compare it uh, to the uh, Sabaya paper where that we're looking at this historic, um, the brafinib response of two years overall survival of 32% or so, if you add, if you, if you compare this to the group or uh, subgroup analysis here, patients that are receiving uh, targeted therapy and uh, immunotherapy, uh, we had a two-year overall survival of 67%, so more than double. So more data and more information and more clinical trials are being uh, done on this. To study this, uh, this is a, a large study that is being, uh, and a multi-site study that is being led by Dr. Zaferio here, uh, and Cabanillas and, and Dr. Busseti and Dr. Dadu, where um, they wanted to evaluate patients receiving dabrafenib, trametinib, and pembrolizumab, so targeted therapy and immunotherapy at the start, uh, prior to uh, potentially surgery and see how the response um, is at that point. And then following uh, three to four months, consider them for surgery. So I'll show you some quick examples of some patients that uh, have been treated by our group and by myself specifically. So this is a patient that was placed on uh, DTP, so dibrafenib, trametinib, and pembrolizumab, um, and three months after had this incredible response. And of course, what you tell yourself is, well, this patient should considered to be uh, resected uh, at this point. So we go from something that is unresectable to something that can receive um, a thyroidectomy, for example. Um, this is a most recent case that I did uh, just a couple of weeks ago. This is a patient who had shown up with significant uh, tumor uh, burden uh, local regionally, uh, vocal cord paralysis, pulmonary metastases as well. Uh, after uh, just three months, um, of uh, the brafinib, shumatib, and primbalizumab, the, there was a resolution of the uh, lung disease and there was a significant decrease in the size of the disease. Now, we thought there may be some remnant disease, of course, so we brought the patient for a, um, you know, we went from needing to do a tracheosophageal resection to being able to just offer even a thyroid lobectomy, which is exactly what uh, I did. Um, and as you can see here, the thyroid lobectomy ended up having just some small pockets of necrosis. Uh, this is the main nodule uh, that we looked at, and uh, there was, you know, slight compression of the esophagus from the, from the disease itself, but there was no remnant disease even on the margins on the esophagus and in the trachea. And the the patient actually had a complete response of the anaplastic thyroid cancer and only had a remnant papillary thyroid cancer of. 1.8 centimeters, and um, uh, I think it was about four or five uh, lymph nodes that were positive with papillary thyroid cancer out of 36 or so that were removed um, uh, for this patient. So once again, a complete response in this patient, and now a patient who's heading for radiation therapy, hopefully in a curative intent. Um, so uh, let me uh, show you this as well. This is another patient uh, who was on uh, immunotherapy and uh, targeted therapy, you know, this pre-therapy, you would say this is 
patient who did not have any sort of uh, surgical or curative intent kind of treatment. And uh, following three months, this patient uh, went for surgery uh, and had barely any metastatic viable uh, carcinoma in, in, in some of the lymph nodes that were removed uh, and then went on for radiation therapy once again, hopefully in a curative intent, which is incredible to think for anaplastic thyroid cancer. So if I quickly go back to uh, this initial uh, major landmark uh, program that was established, uh, the FAST program, you know, what we initially saw is a rapid increase in the number of patients coming in. Um, and then we also saw a rapid increase in the number of patients being involved in clinical trials. And combining those two together, it allows you to study more the disease and be able to develop treatments, can develop uh, treatment algorithms that are then used uh, not only by the institution, but by uh, other institutions around the world. So did this actually translate into an improved survival? And as you would expect with everything I've shown you, we saw a remarkable response uh, and an increase in the survival of these patients. We went from, uh, uh, you know, especially if we compare it to the SEER database that was showing a four month median overall survival, we quadrupled this to a 16 month median survival. Uh, and this is just with a cohort up to 2019. The most recent data we've been showing uh, even longer and even more important uh, responses, which is very, very encouraging for the specific population. So quick clinical pearls that I'll go back to and I'm almost done. Um, uh, you know, we mentioned about the rapid identification of this patient population, quick and efficient patient referral to specialized high volume centers, get the biopsy done as quickly as possible and definitely treat for BRAF at the very least. Uh, once you're able to get uh, some molecular testing, try to focus treatment on a mutation specific type uh, of, of therapy, whether it's targeted therapy and or immunotherapy if possible. Prioritize patients on clinical trials. If you have them available or, or if you're able to do multi-center studies, please do so. And finally, the goal here is to be able to have um, patients involved into uh, allowing them to potentially even get surgery following response to neoadjuvant therapy. Um, there's obviously a lot of work left to be done, um, you know, because this a lot of the data that I'm showing you is on BRAF mutated patients. You have the BRAF non-mutated patients, you have patients that have um, a recurrent disease. This is all data that, you know, I could probably give a whole hour of a talk on it, but uh, uh, I'm happy I've been able to at least share this with you. But these are some of the clinical trials that we're running and we're opening some more um, here at MD Anderson. And a lot of them uh, are going to be um, multi-site as well. I'm going to uh, quickly jump these slides. I was going to show you some of our translational work, but I don't think we have time now. But um, uh, I'll definitely hopefully do this in a later date, uh, uh, maybe Puya, but I'd like to, you know, obviously thank the, the wonderful FAST team here uh, at MD Anderson. This is primarily the team that deals with these patients, uh, but it's not just the clinical team. Obviously, you have a very large team involving both translational studies, uh, lab studies, basic science. Uh, we have trialists, we have surgeons, the pathologists, the radiation oncologists, and the oncologic team. So um, all of this uh, group here, this wonderful group, working uh, very hard to uh, push the envelope on anaplastic thyroid cancer care and aggressive thyroid cancer care altogether. Thank you all very much for your attention. And it was, uh, I'll, I'm open to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Anastasia, for the presentation. Uh, you might get a chance to communicate and show your email. It's uh, amaniacas at mdanderson.org. So anyone interested, you can also reach directly to Professor Maniacas through email. We have some, uh, some questions. Of course, the invitation to complete the whole um, presentation will be extended for the future. Uh, so you will complete this uh, this topic in the future, of course. I really, I really think that what you've shown uh, in regards to what is the team members and what are the algorithm you presented and how much impact you had after the completion of the team in regards to the last ten years and and the results that you have, they correspond exactly to the dramatic decrease. And, and of course, increase in long-term um, impact for the patients, because at the end, 
uh, all this clinical trial has been made by patients that referring to you because you develop your own uh, uh, team. And, and this is important. This is a major message that I always think that we should tell to the residents, to our colleagues, is to build the team. And uh, in before going to in, into, into the questions, uh, my question is, uh, how did you choose your team? And what, what were the, the basic skills that they should have in, in regards to this? That's a wonderful question. And, and I can't emphasize even more what you just said about uh, this is a team effort. And, uh, you know, the complexity of this disease is so uh, high that it really takes uh, multifaceted minds to be able to deal with it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, as you can see from the group that I showed, you need to deal with this in, 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 a, in, in different approaches. You need to use every possible tool set that you have. So you need to find yourself a radiation oncologist, a medical oncologist. You need to find yourself an endocrine specialist, uh, obviously a surgeon uh, there, and, um, and, 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 a, and a pathologist that is very uh, interested in uh, head and neck pathology, right? So we're very fortunate here to have dedicated head and neck pathologists. All they do is head and neck and we have multiple of them, not just one. Um, so this is obviously a, a huge advantage uh, that, 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 that we have and it's a blessing to be able to have that. But in centers, even prior to coming to MD Anderson, um, when I was working in, in Montreal, it was you know, one of the first things that, uh, that I was interested in doing was to be able to develop a similar uh, thing. And, and um, you know, right away, the first thing is you have to find a key member for each of these specialties. Now, the type of person, obviously, you need motivated people, you need people that are interested in the disease. Um, and you need to be able to uh, show now, you know, the person who's the most interested in this is probably the person who will be leading a lot of these efforts. But you need to show enthusiasm, right? It's it's um and it's difficult to say to show enthusiasm in front of a disease that historically patients only survive for a few months, right? How can you be enthusiastic in front of that? And I think that is what really made the big difference here uh, in the group here at MD Anderson is there were some key people that showed significant enthusiasm uh, to try to make a difference in this in this group. And, and, and people just kind of fed off of it and, and, and it, it became contagious. This enthusiasm became very contagious. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's this enthusiasm that I was, you know, uh, infected with as well when I joined here uh, and, and, and wanted to participate in this and, and do it. So I guess to answer this briefly, you need enthusiasm, you need to have, uh, uh, and also you need a lot of support from colleagues. This is not a single person thing. So you need a key person from each of the specialties to be able to, to help you with it. Let's go to the question directly. The first from Germany, what is your opinion on the tyrosine ky kinase inhibitors? So tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, have been used historically in a, in a more broad way, also in the setting of uh, not necessarily anaplastic thyroid cancer, but more in a um, uh, for for aggressive thyroid cancer. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors can show uh, a great response as well. But when you have clear mutations, um, at least here for us, it's very clear. If you have a mutation that is targetable, you should find a uh, you should use a specific targeted uh, mutation, you shouldn't go broad like it. It, could, it can be used in a salvage situation, um, but uh, I think when you have a, a clear mutation, you should be using mutation-oriented uh, disease uh, um, treatment. Tel Aviv, do you think columnar cell variants of PTC have a more aggressive behavior compared to with the classical PTC? So columnar, that's a good, it's a good question. I mean, columnar uh, cell disease, uh, papillary thyroid cancer has been linked. You know, there are lots of reports that talk about it slightly more aggressive, slightly higher chances of having even soft tissue deposits uh, and, and slightly higher chances of being able to have um, uh, more uh, recurrences uh, local regionally. So yes, it's, it's, I think it's more in the setting of recurrence uh, an actual um, distant uh, uh, aggressiveness. But yes, they, they tend to be historically a bit more uh, 
aggressive. Another question from Poland. Difficult to treat, yeah. Poland, what are the ultrasonographic findings? So um, I'm guessing the, the question is for ultrasonographic findings for anaplastic. When patients come in with anaplastic, I mean, they'll have these very large, uh, rapidly growing mass in, in, in the neck. And oftentimes when you're going to be looking in with an ultrasound, all you're going to see is necrosis, um, lots of necrosis. So the idea here is um, you need to be able to uh, have uh, either if yourself you are, are comfortable with ultrasound, if not, you need to have a radiologist who is very comfortable with navigating through this uh, large burden of necrosis. Uh, because if you're not able to um, do so, every biopsy that you do, whether it's a core biopsy uh, or a, a simple FNA, obviously cores are much better in this setting, um, you're going to end up with uh, necrosis and then your pathologist will not be able to give you any diagnosis. So the idea here is to be able to find the pockets of disease, uh, viable disease that you're able to biopsy. Um, there'll be necrosis. You'll, like I said, you'll have also multiple lymph nodes that will definitely show evidence of disease. You know, your classic and large lymph node circular um, loss of a hilum. Um, and, um, uh, but these patients, other than just having an ultrasound, they must have additional imaging. And the imaging usually uh, for, for evaluating anaplastic thyroid cancer, I would suggest is uh, obviously getting at least a CT neck, CT chest, because oftentimes you'll have metastases there. What we do here for our patients, part of the FAST protocol is they get a, uh, obviously an ultrasound guided core biopsy, then they'll get a CT neck, CT chest. We get a PET CT to evaluate distant disease. We'll get an MRI of the brain because we do have patients that often present as well with brain metastases. Um, and, uh, you know, if you get that, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a full workup for, for, uh, for this patient. How long does it take you to have a, a CT scan in, in your preoperative follow-up from, from the diagnosis to the, to the radiological finding? How does it, how, do, how does it take you? So it's, it's, um, Again, we're, we are extremely blessed here with, with, with the amount of resources uh, specifically for this. And the way the program has been set, this FAST program is, there's been an, an almost an agreement made that when a patient comes in under the FAST umbrella, uh, they get prioritized. So literally patients within, like they'll show up to, to the clinic, we'll see them, we'll suspect ATC or we'll have a diagnosis of ATC coming from outside. And within 24 to 48 hours, they've gotten everything done. Uh, all the imaging, right. you know, and, and this is, and this is, you know, again, from a lot of hard work put in to be able to secure this kind of uh, access to imaging for these patients. Um, when I was in, in Montreal, um, you know, there were, and it, which was a very different setting in a more in a public setting that patients there sometimes uh, historically could take two weeks, three weeks, they get a CT scan. When I was, you know, involved in, in developing a similar uh, ATC directed program, there was an agreement already set up. So uh, with the radiologist that they would get prioritized PET CTs instead of taking two weeks to get them, we would get them within three, four days. Um, so again, in a setting of a public setting, uh, we I was able to make that difference. But again, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of understanding and, and you need to have agreements with your uh, different departments. Yeah, because time effort and all this make a, a lot of changes in this and it's, right. it's a great deal three to four days another question from india which is you know immuno is to chemical markers would you use to differentiate between anaplastic carcinoma and other undifferentiated malignancies so usually patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer will have the loss so the, the what you what you will test is uh ttf1 you'll look at pax8 um, you'll look, you, obviously you need to test your BRAF to see if it's BRAF positive or not. Um, but these are usually the main ones that will be tested to see if you have complete loss of, of pax TTF1, there is no um, TG involvement either staining on it. And you, it, that, it makes it pretty clear that you've lost, uh, you're, you're fully undifferentiated here. If you start having, for example, TTF1 that's positive, I would be a bit, um, suspicious of the ATC diagnosis. Now, that also, there's a caveat in that because ATC doesn't necessarily um, take over the entire tumor, right? ATC developed from something. 
So it's very possible that in your same slide, you can, or in your, in your same cut of the specimen, you'll have some ATC here, some PTC there, some PDTC there. So it's, you know, you, you need to have a pathologist that is savvy enough to be able to uh, evaluate the, the specimen and look at it in different slices in different settings, because you may um, have a false negative if you don't necessarily look at the right spot. Great. We have the, the time just for another question. What, uh, this is from Brazil. What is the preoperative pharmacological treatment that you would suggest? Right. So in terms of uh, patients that are BRAP mutated um, with ATC, we recommend right now uh, dabrafenib, trametinib, which is the combination of targeted therapies. It's a BRAF and a MEK inhibitors. And then we also recommend that we add immunotherapy. Pembrolizumab is usually what we're testing right now, both on and off trial. Once the patient has had a good response to that, then we usually consider surgery. If the surgery, um, after the surgery, we then uh, place them on uh, either chemo RT and then put them back on uh, the Braffinitrum and Pembrolizumab. Patients that are BRF non-mutated, so BRF wild type, then usually these patients will go on immunotherapy with or without um, uh, uh, a, a drug such as lumbatinib, for example, that could be an option, but then you also have to evaluate how aggressive is and how invasive is the disease. If they have disease that is invading vessels or the trachea, putting them on lumbatinib can sometimes be very risky, uh, fistulas and, 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 and significant bleeds. So, um, you know, patients will almost all be put on some form of immuno uh, therapy. And then after that, depending on the mutations, we'll look at what kind of mutation directed therapy we can give them. Some patients may even have a RET mutation. At that point, we can even potentially consider RET-specific uh, drugs. So great deal. Uh, thank you for all the, the time that you spend in here. And of course, there's a lot out of 15 questions. I will try to send you back. And if um, for anyone already sent their questions, please also send me your email. And, and if you can't, just send him uh, sent to uh, Professor Maniakas your question, and I think that he will be able to reply in the next few days uh, because he's very busy, of course, as you see. No, please, uh, thank please, you. Please <laughs> yeah, my, my, it was my pleasure to, to, to answer and to converse more offline. Thank you. Before uh, um, ending this meeting, is there any um, Congress, conference, uh, or a practical um, course that you would like to suggest for anyone interested in this specific topic? So I think one of the most, uh, you know, high, high value uh, meetings or conferences to, to attend for thyroid cancer disease as a whole, um, I think I would put in those the both the ATA, so the American Thyroid Association meeting, or the ETA, the European Thyroid Association meeting, those are both excellent. And I think uh, we'll always uh, give you the highest and latest data and research on, on, on the topics. Um, after that, um, you know, as an otolaryngologist trained, I think the American Head and Neck Society meeting is also um, a very strong one, just as the uh, European uh, Head and Neck Society uh, meeting. I think those two are, are very strong and always have a, a decent amount of um, uh, panels and sessions primarily for thyroid cancer, if, if that is of interest. After that, there are courses that are given. Um, there's the World Thyroid uh, Conference that's given uh, on, a, uh, I think, every two or three uh, months or so. No, sorry, every, every three, uh, two or three quarters, they'll, they'll be able to give some form of uh, conference or talks or seminars. Um, and then after that, there's a lot, a lot of, uh, because this is such a rapidly changing uh, and rapidly progressing uh, research area, um, I think just staying on top of, uh, of the literature is the, is the best that you can do. So uh, um, if not, the ATA and the ETA, I think, are probably your best bet uh, for that. After that, there are some small courses here and there that are being given, uh, I think, both on a national and international stage. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I, I would I would probably suggest the ATA and the ETA for your top places. 
Thank you. So I uh, remind everyone, if you want to see again these meetings, you can go and uh, on our YouTube channel or social media channels and you can watch it again and share with your colleagues. A quick reminder, upcoming meetings next Wednesday, we have uh, Martin Desrosier from Montreal, and he's going to talk about success in CRS treatment requires modulation of both inflammation and the epithelial barrier, a transcriptomic analysis. Thank you for now. Thank you, Anastasios, for being with Thank us. And I hope to see you soon. Wonderful invite. Thank you all.